Welcome to Cable's Farm. This is the third of my post-coronavirus uh, videos and we're going to look at uh, the history of firearms. In particular uh, we'll be looking at uh, the evolution of the flintlock in England from about uh, 1750 through to the percussion era. So, uh, when did it all start? Well, probably uh, around the middle of the 14th century, sort of 1350 or something like that, uh, hand cannon uh, became uh, possible. These were basically initially uh, very crude tubes uh, filled with gunpowder with uh, either an arrow or a stone in the end, they would be fired uh, by uh, some form of ignition, possibly a red hot wire um, shoved in a touch hole. Uh, they were probably uh, more like fireworks than we would think of as an explosive. The gunpowder would have been really very inferior, um, basically because they had A, no idea of the chemistry of it, and B, uh, because uh, it was very difficult to purify the ingredients. They were all pretty crude. So we have those uh, very crude uh, hand cannon f sort of from, I don't know, uh, the third quarter of the 14th century through to the middle of the 15th century when they began to get uh, a little more sophisticated, something we might recognise now. Um, the, the next development uh, of significance in the in the firearms world uh, was the the matchlock the matchlock uh, was a kind of improvement uh, over the the hand cannon in that it had a stock uh, and there was a small pan attached to the barrel which held a little bit of priming powder and it was fired off by a match um, the match being uh, a piece of woven um, rope which had been dipped in something to make it glow, say saltpeter or something. So that was carried uh, by the, uh, the, the shooter uh, who would then aim his, uh, uh, his matchlock and apply the match to the pan. Um, later on he got a cover over the pan so he could have it primed and then open the pan. Um, the, the early matchlocks were very heavy, so he would have probably carried, there would probably have been two people per matchlock in the, in the early days with, with what was called an aquabus, and um, they would have a stand, a prop for the end of the barrel, and so there would be two people to manage the gun and the, the match. I mean, the, the problem with, uh, with matchlocks, which incidentally stayed really in as as a as a military weapon were still around uh more or less at the time of the english civil war and the, the the halfway through the 17th century they were still around and the, the problem of course was that you always had to carry uh something that was a light um at the same time as you were carrying around gunpowder and needing to reload your gun. So there was always a, 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 an element of risk uh, that, uh, that some terrible accident would happen. Anyway, the, um, so that's, that's the matchlock, which uh, was very cheap to build, uh, very simple, very rugged, not much to go wrong, um, and thus ideal for a military situation. Now, the, the, the follow-on... Uh, from the matchlock that was the first of the self-contained ignition systems and that was the wheel lock and here is a detached wheel lock uh, from um, from Germany from probably the 17th century uh, it's an original genuine wheel lock um, and as you can see, I'll show, I'll show this later on in more detail, 
but it's a very complicated piece of mechanism. It worked by having a piece of parietes uh, in a jaw, which pressed, when you put the, the cock down, pressed onto a wheel, serrated wheel. Uh, the serrated wheel connected to a touch hole, uh, and which was this side, and so you put some gunpowder around the edge of the serrated wheel. There's a very big mainspring uh, which wound up the wheel and on firing you know, the wheel would whiz round uh, and the parietes which were rubbing against it would spark which would set fire to the powder in the pan which would ignite uh, the, the powder in the barrel. So the beauty of that system was that you didn't actually have any, uh, any fire with you for most of the time you were using the gun. It was only at the point where you pulled the trigger that you actually got fire. So that was the, the that's really the first of the fire locks. Um, the disadvantage of it, of course, is it's a horrendously complicated piece of mechanism and the spring needed uh, to wind up, uh, which is this spring here, to wind up the wheel is, is massive and all this mechanism has to be really quite precisely made. And so uh, it never caught on as a real military weapon. Uh, the, first, um, the first sort of sketch of, of, of uh, the workings of a wheel lock is in a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci from about 1480 uh, something. I think that's right, is it? Um, yeah, 1480, around 1480, 1485, there is a sketch that looks like a wheel lock. Now, nobody knows whether Leonardo sketched it from a design that he is something he's seen or whether he invented it clean out of the air like he did a lot of other things. So there's a certain amount of doubt about that. Um, but uh, it was quite, it was a few years sort of um, 30 odd years before we have definite proof from Nuremberg in Germany of uh, the fact that people were actually using uh, wheel locks. So that's a definite date for the, the existence of wheel locks is uh, 15, 15, 16 or thereabouts between there 15, 15, 15, 20, something in those the early part of, of the 16th century. So, uh, and wheel locks, they're kind of complicated mechanisms, as, as you can see. Um, and they appealed really rather, I think, to the German sense of engineering. And so they were far more popular uh, in Germany than anywhere else. And in Germany, they really continued uh, in in use as hunting weapons until about, uh, at least until uh, 1650 and probably quite a lot later than that. So around that sort of time, the, the flintlock was being uh, developed in the form of a snap haunch, which I don't have, uh, which was an early form of, of flintlock where the pan cover and the steel that the um, flint strikes against were not the same piece of metal. So you had a pan cover you had to open and then the steel was struck. So following on from that, which I don't have one on of, uh, we come on to this, which is a reproduction of uh, an English dog lock, uh, so called because uh, of this little catch on the back here, which was the dog that caught on, oh, it's quite tough, that caught on the cock and prevented it from being, prevented it from firing. So there's the dog on, so that's safe. And then if you, if you then cock it, you knock the dog off and it'll now fire. So you can now shoot it. Uh, I'm not gonna fire this one. Um, the flint's too short actually. So that is probably a, a, a replica of a Civil War, sort of 1650s uh, military pistol. It's, it's pretty massive. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really a two-handed job. So 
So it's, it's almost a carbine uh, in size. So there we we have uh, the next. That's the next development. Uh, from there, we're beginning to get into things that look like um, uh, what we'd recognise as a sort of flintlocks. I haven't got a very early flintlock. The the earliest flintlock I've got um, is this nice silver-mounted pistol by Barber, uh, and it has um, it has hall marks on it on the silver which date it to um, 1763. So that's the earliest one I've got. Um, Barber was a, a well-known maker and this has got a number of features which we'll look at later. Uh, we're going to go through and look at what features, uh, the dating of features of these pistols. This one has a nice silver back uh, side plate. It's got some nice decorations uh, and a nice escutcheon, uh, silver butt cap, ears on the butt cap. So we'll look in, we'll look in detail at those. Characteristic uh, curved lock convex lock surface. Um, so that's that one. And then we're going to move on a little bit and we're going to go to probably about uh, 17. Uh, maybe maybe 1780 uh, to this, which is an Irish duelling pistol um, by Hutchinson of Dublin. Uh, it's quite a nice one and it's quite typical. So we're going to look at the details of that. Um, so that would be 17, the end, the last quarter probably, beginning of the last, yeah, well, the last quarter of, of the 18th century. And this was, in, this period was very interesting because that uh, period um, from about 1760 when Barber was around through to the percussion era and then onwards was when uh, really the, sup the supremacy in, our, in firearms design and manufacture um, passed from being in the hands of the French uh, and the Belgians and the Italians to uh, basically being uh, in the hands of the English. So the English really had, had this sort of renaissance uh, between um, probably 1760 and uh, Eighteen, eighteen, twenty, when a lot of very good gun makers, the Mantons, Twig, uh, Mortimer, a whole lot of very well-known names, were making guns, um, and they invented all sorts of wonderful little uh, gizmos and changes, which, which really meant that at the end of that period, by uh, say 1810 if you wanted the best in sporting guns or pistols uh, you came to England to get them and uh, finish off, I will finish off uh, with this rather nice coaching pistol I wouldn't like to be at the receiving end of that uh, when somebody pulled the trigger uh, 20 bore coaching pistol double barreled and that uh, is actually by Fishenden of Tunbridge, uh, rather nicely made. And that he he wasn't in he wasn't uh, in business until 1823. So this is right at the end of the flintlock era. They didn't go much. Nothing much happened beyond. In fact, I think no no technical development happened really beyond. Uh, that sort of date. The um, the key dates the key dates for uh, percussion are um, uh, eighteen o seven when um, Forsyth uh, patented the process for uh, ignition by um, percussion. So he took um, the uh, he took the principle uh, and made it into a working lock, this, this well-known scent bottle, his scent bottle lock. 
and thereafter uh, he had he had um, a master patent he took out in in 1807 with some help from other people in London uh, he took out a very powerful patent which was the master patent for percussion ignition um, and that protected him uh, for a while and really uh, I think um, Manton had a bash at patenting tube locks and I, I think the date of that was 1817 I'm not too sure um, and, and that that, that uh, got challenged in court uh, by Forsyth along with a whole lot of other people um, Manton at that point um, Forsyth patent was about to expire and uh, some kind of deal was done and Manton carried on making tube locks and then shortly after that probably uh, dates are a bit difficult to judge but probably around 1823-24 when when this guy came on the market uh, or came into business um, the percussion cap the copper little copper cap uh, with a, a bit of um, uh, a, 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 a primer inside it a percussion primer inside it became the norm for igniting guns so we'll have a look at those those pistols, these pistols I've shown you, I'll look at them in a little more detail um, if you like to hang on a bit longer. Thank you. Right, we're now going to have a look at uh, some of those locks and pistols that I uh, talked about earlier. So here's the wheel lock, German, uh, maybe around late, late, some, late uh, 17th century probably. Uh, genuine lock without its gun. So here's the the, the cock. Um, there's the piece of parietes which is going to produce the sparks. Uh, you can see here the spring, the cock spring that actuates the cock, holds it down. It doesn't come down with a crash, it's held against the wheel uh, while the wheel, and then the wheel then starts and that's what causes the sparks. So here's the key um, and the shaft that uh, that winds up the um, the wheel. So if we turn it over now, you can see what a horrendous mechanism this is. So here's the back of the cock, which is, as you can see, not a simple piece of mechanism. There's the uh, the cock spring. So underneath the covers here, we have the wheel. The wheel bearing is is this little pip here. So the wheel is here. This is the mainspring that acts on a little piece of chain that wraps itself around the wheel here. So when you wind it up, uh, you pull up the main, you you pull up the chain which pulls up the mainspring. So that's your your firing. Then uh, here, this is the pan cover. So that's automatic in this one. That's automatically pushed back when you fire it. So that goes back. Uh, you can then see uh, the wheel down here. So this is the this is the pan uh, that you put the priming in, and there's the wheel. And then the parietes comes down, and as the wheel rotates very quickly when you pull the trigger, uh, generates a spark. So there's, and you can see it's not a simple thing. The um, the sear. Well, there's there's the the where the trigger acts. The sear is a little pip that goes into a hole in the back of the wheel there and in this one uh, it, it's uh, worn, or, worn away. So it's a very susceptible, I mean it's not a particularly um, robust mechanism. Uh, there's, this, is, this is the spring here that, that, um, that, that, oh, that locks in the, the pan cover which is all very stiff so it's all really quite a high force structure um so that's that's the the wheel lock we'll put that aside because it's uh, right now what we're going to have a look at now um is uh here's we're going to have a look at that reproduction um more or less civil war uh dog lock so here's uh the dog on the back um 
the cot and the dog the dog engages uh, with the back end to put it on safety so there's there's your safety another characteristic feature is this buffer here which is what stops uh, when we fire it which is what stops the um, the cock from going down any further so that's the stop for the cock now the the um, the the unique thing about the early um, uh, what you you what you might general class in general as flintlocks but weren't actually called that um, the the characteristic of them is that the sear uh, instead of acting like a modern one which we'll show you comes out acts horizontally and comes out through a slot in the side of the lock and actually engages um, with that uh, that platform so you can see now the sear is engaged so if I pull the trigger the sear disappears back into the um, into the lock and lets it off so the characteristics of of these early pistols are horizontal sears right so we're going to move on now to uh, the main meat which is um, the the, uh, the 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 true flintlock now I think the true flintlock probably um, is dated from around 1650 uh, but we don't have anything that old um, so the earliest one I've got here uh, is a rather nice pistol by Barber it's um, beautifully silver mounted uh, it's it's one of his good good quality ones um, and we can have a look at that to see what the features were that that date it uh, as early I mean in this case we have hallmarks on the silver uh, furniture and these are the hallmarks for uh, 1763 so we don't have to make a complicated uh, calculation we know that this pistol was around um, 1763 but it has a number of features would which would pick it out as early um, <coughs> particularly uh, we would see uh, a rounded profile on the lock uh, without any fancy engraving on it although earlier it would have had some strawberry leaf engraving but we'd see the rounded lock and the rounded uh, cock we'd see uh you see it the bat the trigger ends in a little curl backwards so that would that would also be an indication that it was that early um the uh, the, the the butt cap the butt is is rounded um presumably uh that that feature's always interested me, presumably because mainly they were carried in, in, in holsters on horses, in which case you needed a sort of knob to pull them out with. But anyway, the, 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 that, that sort of shape is, is characteristic, um, although it's carried on a lot longer in military pistols for the presumably the same reason. So another feature which would, would date it is these fancy escutcheons later on they disappeared almost completely um, and the, the shell carving on the back here the side plate uh, is, is fairly early the fact that it has and one of them is missing has two side screws holding the lock on that's an early feature um, it has uh, pins holding all the furniture on uh, including I assume the trigger guard um, and the uh, the trigger is is on a pin going through the wood. So, and the other feature which you might uh, you might notice is that this has the barrel tang is integral with the breech block which screws into the barrel. So um, that's like that. So that's part of essentially part of the breech block that screws into the barrel. Later on. Um, you would have found that there was a separate piece here and hooks that held it up. Anyway, so there's there's our um, uh, 1763 pistol, round barrel with a flat on it. Um, 
fairly fancy. It's a good, I mean, this is a good quality one. You can see uh, the silver furniture. It's rather beautiful. Um, so that's that one. Now we're going to move on to look at the developments which, uh, which followed from that sort of period. Right, so now we're going to have a look at the uh, Hutchinson dueling pistol. Uh, probably um, around uh, 1775, 1780, something like that. Uh, so what have we got uh, that's different from the barber? Uh, what characteristics have we passed on to from uh, that uh, 1763 pistol to uh, 17... Hmm, let's call it 1775, something of that order. So we've got a flat lock. We've no longer got the convex lock. We've, we've acquired some engraving on it. Got a stepped tail to it. Um, the cock's got a little bit of engraving in it. Uh, the um, we've we've got a uh, the pan is now a semi-rainproof pan, so that uh, it's a bit less prone to water running into the pan if it's if it's raining lightly. If it's raining heavily, you've had it. Um, but if it's raining lightly, you might might achieve something with that semi-rainproof pan. Uh, what else is, is particular about um, this gun, uh, this pistol? Well, uh, it's unusual in that um, if you look at the uh, this side of the pistol, there are no screws. There's no... Uh, lock plate as such as a little escutcheon but uh, no lock plate no screws that's unusual I mean I, I'm, I'm not sure I've ever seen uh, a pistol like that before no screws so how's the lock held on well the lock is held on by a hook on this end and by one screw that goes through through the lock into the false breech so it goes into the side of the false breech so that's unusual feature of this. This is a um, Hutchinson of Dublin, so it's an Irish Irish dueling pistol, uh, and a lot of these sort of decorations and things probably characteristic of Irish pistols. The other one, there's another unusual feature of this pistol, which if you look uh, quite carefully in here, I can show you. There is a link between the end of the frizzen and the frizzen spring. So if you can see that moving, there's a little link in there, as distinct from either nothing, uh, as on the barber, or rollers. And initially the roller would have been after, the link came first, I think, uh, and after the link, the roller would have been put on the bottom of the frizzen for a little while, uh, the fashion was, and then finally ended up with the roller being part of the uh, frizzen spring. So that would be the evolution of that. Uh, what else has changed from the barber? So we've got now, um, we've got these little straight barrel bolts, little flat barrel bolts holding the barrel in instead of pins. So that's new, but they haven't got yet got uh, any kind of escutcheon around them. So this was probably, oh, I don't know, we might, we might say that you'd get that around 17, when would we, when would we like to put that, 17, getting on for 1780, 17, late 1770s, that feature would have come in. So there's, there's our thing, oh yes, we, we, we'd look here and we see an acorn, um, a very distinct acorn finial, uh, and that's a, a, a reasonably early feature. Now it has to be said that, um, particularly when you're dealing with uh, with non-London gun makers and provincial gun makers or Irish gun makers, that the dating of these features uh, is more difficult because the, they they may not have gone with the 
quick, very quickly with the London fashions. So this, it's a bit more difficult to, to, um, to date these things. In fact, it may be later, maybe a little bit later than, than I'm imagining it. So there's a, a nice Irish dueling pistol. It would originally have been uh, one of a pair. I mean, almost always pistols were sold in pairs, They're priced in pairs, sold in pairs. Very, very seldom, I think, would a pistol have been sold as a single. So there's that one. I'll just show you a couple of features on another. Uh, this is an officer's pistol by Andrews uh, of London. So this uh, has more or less uh, similar features. If you're very observant, you'll notice the cock's got the same engraving as the Irish uh, Hutchinson pistol. That's because it's a replacement cock and uh, I took it off the off the same uh, casting as the as the Hutchinson one. So this has acquired um, a rounded end to the lock, which is a bit later feature, quite a lot later feature. Uh, it's got um, a safety catch on here. That's mm, 1880s type feature. Um, this one has well, it's missing, but it's got one side. This is the conventional design one side screw here um, and a hook on the front end of that so we've we've got to we've got to having the roller now on the end of the frizzen spring and we've got the fully rainproof pan here so we're we're kind of got there now um, it this would have had a different cock I think because the the, the there's a flat on the top of the um, flash guard which I think the cock would originally have come to rest on so I probably put the wrong cock on that uh, what else can I show you I can show you um, I can show you the uh, the hooked false breech um, which is a, a 1780s feature um, something no a bit earlier than that probably something 70s feature of uh, a hooked breech uh, and that goes into this false breech here uh, we've we now got instead of fancy escutcheons we've now got a little square escutcheon on there we're into um period when checkering appears on stocks uh flat top checkering um not not much this oh yes well i suppose the main the main uh yeah we're into not quite a full stopped gun so we we've we've we're not we're not half stopped but we're not full stopped now so uh, so there's our little andrews pistol right and so uh, we nearly nearly at the end now we just have a quick look at um, this one again uh, <coughs> this is a nice 20 bore double barreled um, double barreled uh, coaching pistol so that would have been used carried by somebody traveling by coach uh, well perhaps it's getting to the end of the getting to the end of um, the era because that's this is this the maker started business in 1823 so um, by then mm, you've still got stage coaches but uh, the menace of, of highwaymen was beginning to decline I think by then um, you haven't yet got to the railways when I suppose nobody would have carried a coaching pistol anymore so we're still in the coaching era um, but that's a rather nice pistol that's got all of the uh, it's got a lot of modern features on it um, you don't get much later than that fully rainproof pan um, obviously with these double barrel pistols uh, one of the uh, the side screw goes in through one lock right the way through the pistol through the wood uh, and holds the other lock on so uh, there's your 
Whoops, got the right trigger. Let it down. There we are. So that's a nice, nice coaching pistol. So I think that's kind of covered all of the developments in the flintlock from uh, 1760 up to uh, 1823, which is effectively the end of the flintlock era.